Hello, this is the interview on France 24. Today with a special programme as we mark nine years since the outbreak of war in Syria. Our guest today is a doctor who spent five years treating patients under the missiles and bombs of the Syrian regime and its Russian backers in eastern Ghouta. Dr. Amani Balour was just 25 years old and fresh out of medical school when the siege began. Her experiences and eventual evacuation were the subject of a documentary, The Cave, which was nominated at this year's Oscars. Amani Balour, thank you very much for being our guest today on France 24. Thank you for having me. Well, I'd like to start off uh, for our viewers so they can understand a little bit what your experience was. We have a very short snippet from the documentary. This is The Cave, directed by Feras Fayad. There we are, Dr. Amani Balour. Just a tiny little bit there, like I said, of the five years that he spent as a, not just a doctor at that hospital, but the manager of the hospital as well in eastern Ghouta. How do you feel seeing those images uh, presented as a documentary? Uh, to me, it's not uh, a movie. It's my reality. It's our life in the eastern Ghouta. We didn't expect that we gonna stay for more than five years uh, in underground hospital in dark place mm. and to be afraid all this time under bombing. Uh, we didn't expect that we just start, um, you know, everything start in Syria, just peaceful demonstrations. And uh, the Syrian army and uh, the Syrian regime start to shoot people, then bomb them, besiege them. That was shocked. Shocking for us, we didn't expect that, but we, of course, we had to help these people. So we, we want from this documentary to, to show people a piece of the truth. It's just minutes comparing with the long time we stayed there. So uh, it's and to, to me, it's very uh, uh, easy scenes in this film. You didn't see uh, the dead bodies which we saw, we mm. didn't see, you didn't see uh, the chemical attack in 2013, you didn't see the blood and parts of bodies, which we always, every day, were watching that. And it wasn't just that trauma and that terror, it was also the fact that you had sometimes no electricity, almost no food, almost no medicine. We see in the film there are shortages. There's also no anaesthetic. The doctor's actually playing classical music during uh, the operations. Uh, can you just tell us a bit more about that experience, trying to work as a doctor in those experience, in those conditions? It, yeah, it's very difficult to work as a doctor with, with nothing, actually. At the beginning, we had at the first or two years of the siege, we didn't expect that he, he gonna be seized us in this brutal way, about half million civilian, more than 100,000 child, Without food, without medicine, we have very few resources. Mm. We try to uh, to find uh, other ways to make the operation, to help the injured people, and bombing all the time, every day or every few days. We have massacres. So it was very, very difficult to us to, to find everything. I remember some patients died because lack of food, some patients died because lack of medicine, mm. some cancer patients. We just asked to evacuate them. They are cancer patients and they need uh, chemical therapy. And we ask all the people and we talk on the media just to evacuate some patients out of Al Ghouta. But Assad regime and Russia refused and said no. And yeah, and they died one by one mm. and no one cared about them. And especially to me, I was working as pediatrician. I had no long experience to do that, but I forced to work as pediatrician. We were few doctors and a lot of mm. people, they need help. So it was very difficult to work with the children, to hear children every day, their questions, their pain. They are afraid. They were afraid of bombing all the time. I tried to support them, tell them not to be afraid, but I was afraid of bombing. All of us was afraid. Mm. We we tried to to help them. We asked them, and all the time the children said, "We are hungry. We are hungry. Why we are besieged?" I can find the answers for their simple questions. 
Well, we also see that you're, of course, working while the bombings are happening. Uh, the hospital itself gets hit by three missiles during the filming of the documentary. Uh, do you believe that the, the Russian and the Syrian forces knew that they were hitting hospitals? Do you think that they were deliberately trying to target those sorts of areas? Uh, yeah, I believe that they, they want to target hospitals because they targeted my, my hospital. Just they came many times, they targeted it. And of course, they know. And they targeted all the, the hospitals actually around us in Al Ghouta. They targeted it. Why and, did they uh, think they were doing that? They were trying to make you leave? Because it's the hospitals is the hope or the only hope for people who who there be for sick people and injured people because they bomb all the time and can you imagine if the injured people don't find a hospitals to to treat mm -hmm. them how would it be there it would be no life no life without hospital they want us to give up. And there's also a chemical attack uh, towards the end of the film, uh, not the one from 2013 that, that you mentioned before the cameras were there. Um, but we see how the, the doctors and the people working in the hospital become aware of a smell of chlorine. Um, you had to choose who to help in that situation. Yeah, the chemical attack was also shocking for us. We didn't imagine that he uh, targeted us in chemical weapons. You know, and uh, the chlorine one was easier than the sarin one. The chlorine, uh, we, we had no dead uh, cases. It, it was a little easier than... It, it's scare, scaring for the people to, to mm. smell chemical gas, but the sarin one, and that time in 2013, we had to choose who, who we were going to help because there were thousands of victims. They targeted two big cities in Al Ghouta, and there were thousands of people are suffocating. All of them have the same symptoms. But we, we have no choice. We, you, you see, all these people, we were few doctors. We have no, no medicine. But, but that was the most difficult thing I faced in Al-Ghouta. Um, in terms of the chemical attacks, this is internationally classed as a war crime. Uh, are you hopeful that the people responsible for this war crime will face justice at some point? Actually, the international community do nothing for Syria. They let us down, all the world let Syrian down. And this happened in 2013. After that, we were hopeful that they want to stop this criminal, they want to end this siege, stop bombing, but nothing happened. And we were really shocked after that. And after this attack, especially in 2013, I was very hopeless. And I, I believed that time that no one of us will survive. We all gonna die because they are watching. They know about the chemical attack and they, they're just mm -hmm. watching. They do nothing. Um, I'm not... You know, now all Syrian, we don't trust them. We don't trust international community now. We just uh, uh, try to ask again and again and talk again because we want to help these people who are dying now. I believe that finally justice will be done, but I'm, I'm not hopeful that it will gonna be soon. There is currently a new migration crisis flaring up uh, um, partially with many of the millions of Syrians who've been displaced, like yourself, either within Syria or outside Syria's borders. Uh, a lot of people here in the European Union, ordinary people and political leaders with a lot of power, say Europe is full and can't afford, has no space, doesn't have the money to take in more asylum seekers. What would you say to those people? Uh, actually, I'm very sad to hear that, and I'm really shocked after see that the Arab close the border and they don't want to receive more refugees. They are, they are humans, and we know about Europe. It's, it's the place where where there are human rights, where they respect humans, and that's why we are shocked to see that they close their border and don't want to receive these people. Can you imagine what, what kind of life mm. uh, forced these people to leave? Mm -hmm. I think as a humans, we are respond we are all responsible for each other, and we have we have to help these people. And there's another issue that's a major preoccupation all around the world, the coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, people here in France with a very developed uh, medical and healthcare system are very worried about it. And of course, it, it, it could infect people inside Syria in those camps. Are you worried about the impact that the illness could have if it reaches these Syrians? Yeah, we, we all worried about Syria because, you know, there there are no uh, no good health system. Actually, no, no health system. And especially in Northwest now, uh, you know, Assad regime don't care about the humans. They, they start to kill humans nine years ago and now they are killing people. So they don't care about people. People now are afraid and... Uh, 
and they have the right to be afraid because you know the situation they all live in the camps they don't find uh, a hospital to go now millions of people are very far off the hospital they have to walk in the cold for long hours to to get the mm -hmm. the medical care so it's 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 going to be a big disaster if it happened in syria I just want to end with one last question. There's a very touching scene in the film where we see you talking with a little girl about what she might do in the future when she's grown up, maybe be a doctor or a teacher. We can see you trying to inspire her for the future. Um, what is your hope for the children of Eastern Ghouta and the rest of Syria when this war is over? The children, uh, unfortunately, they paid and they still paying the high price of this war. They understand nothing and they have the right to be protected, to, to feel, to think about the future, to think that they're going to survive. We try to do that a lot in Al Ghuta, but you know, the circumstances were very, very bad. And now the same children who were suffering in Al Ghuta, they, they are displaced to Idlib and they, they are living now in the same circumstances, under bombing again. They are dying from cold. Mm. And this is really shame on international community, on all the world to watch them dying. We want them to, to, to just think uh, about their future, to, to feel that they, are, they just want to feel safe. They, they just want to uh, mm. uh, get rid of the, these uh, circumstances, the bombing, and they have the right. You know, now, before this last campaign, about more than two million child without schools, without education. So mm. no future waiting for them. All right, Dr. Amani Balor, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. But thank you so much for coming to see us here on France 24. Thank you so much. And thanks to you for watching at the interview. Do stay tuned to France 24. Bahrain, where Shiites and Sunnis live side by side, is becoming the latest hotspot for clubbing, finance and technology. The oil boom is coming to an end, tensions are easing and change is underway. If data is the new oil, then we are building the modern pipelines. But while the Bahrain government boasts of economic development and harmonious social relations, gaping inequalities and deep social scars paint a different picture. It's really difficult to find a job. It's like a nightmare for uh, university students. Can Bahrain come together and stay together? The forgotten revolution of the Arab Spring, all this week on France 24.